Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Well, I caught some people off guard. They were still talking and chatting. <laughs> now they're hurrying to their seats. It's good to see everybody here today. I want to start us out before we sing our first song. I want to read scripture. It's Psalm 66, 1 and 2. It says, Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. And that's what we want to do this morning as we sing our songs and as we listen to our service today. Let's all stand. We are going to sing, This is the day into he has made me glad. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is be seated. Let me take a moment and just welcome you to Golden Isles Baptist Church. If you are visiting with us today, thank you so much for being with us. And I would love uh, if you could, there is a card in front of you in the seats. If you would grab one of those, fill that out and put it in the box on your way out. Uh, I'd just love to have a record of your visit. Don't worry, I'm not going to hound you, but I would love to just be able to, to know your name and be able to pray for you. And thank you so much for being here. Uh, let me share with you a few things that I just wanted to mention today. Uh, I have two two uh, praises, I guess, to give, and then one uh, one prayer request. I do want to mention, uh, if if you could, uh, let me let me mention a praise. Number one, Brother Herbert went home this week, so that was a big praise, and uh, and I'm so grateful that he was doing uh, so much better. I called him. Um, oh, when did I call? I called him Friday to see how he was doing. Now, he got out of the hospital Wednesday evening, 
And I called him Friday. I said, Brother Herbert, how you doing? He said, well, I'm in Sam's. <laughs> so he's feeling better. He's back, you know, he, um, <laughs> he's, st- <laughs> he's still getting his energy back up. I think this is the first time, you know, they got the mechanical little, uh, the little chairs that you can use there. It, he, he, he said this is the first time he ever used one of those things. So his, uh, his grandson took him uh, to Sam's, and so listen, I'm grateful that he is doing so much better, and uh, I know he'll be back here as soon as he's uh, physically able, but uh, and I know he would appreciate to continue praying for him as he keeps recovering. And then uh, I know Miss Nita was telling me that um, we had been, she had put a prayer request out for her sister who had been uh, diagnosed with uh, stage 4 cancer, and she went to the doctor this week, and the praise report is... It's not cancer. So that's what they have told her. So listen, we're going to take that as a big praise report. And uh, don't know what the doctors were looking at. There, there is some things there that they're going to monitor. But, man, what a blessing. I mean, she thought, she thought that uh, the Lord was getting ready to bring her home. And, and that's not apparently the case. And so uh, we just want to praise the Lord for that. I do want to mention, though, uh, Miss Kathy Stubbs. And, and I know that many of you have seen this on Facebook. If you're not aware uh, Miss Kathy is, um, she had the, her cancer came back and uh, it came back very aggressively and she is not, uh, there's really nothing that the doctors can do for her. So she has been, uh, sh- yesterday she was brought back to hospice, uh, Golden House Hospice over here uh, right down the street. And um, so if you would be praying for her, I, I don't know how long she has. It's uh, my understanding is it's probably uh, only uh, a few weeks, I believe. Um, but if you would be praying for her and the family, I know they would appreciate it. I went by and saw her this morning. Uh, she is doing a lot of sleeping, uh, but uh, be praying for her. And, and it broke my heart as she was sitting there. She said the one thing she wished she could, she just wishes she could come back to church one more time. Listen, I know we come and we worship. Don't ever take for granted the opportunity to come and worship. You never know when your last opportunity to be here to worship might be. And so when you have the opportunity to be here and, and worship with, with us and um, be praying for Miss Kathy and, and the whole family, and, and I know they would, they would greatly appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to ask Miss Mullen to come back, lead us in another song, and um, go ahead and do that. All right, we're going to sing the wonder of it all.
supposed to go ahead okay I don't know I don't know I see him over here waiting I don't know to see everyone on this nice cool morning uh, today is pastor appreciation day and I know all of you appreciate this man as much as I do. And so we want to show him our appreciation by presenting him with a small token of our appreciation. Would you give our pastor a great hand? As I say every time, it is... Uh, my honor to be your pastor and i'm so grateful the lord has placed me here and given me the opportunity to serve him here and i pray for many more years and many uh many more opportunities to to just love and to serve our church and um, i love each and every one of you and appreciate it so much thank you let me share a few announcements we'll go backwards now it's all right <laughs> Let me share a few things with you. Don't forget, on Wednesdays, we have our We Believe series. We are going through our Bible Doctors. We are almost finished. Um, and so I want to encourage you to be here this Wednesday as we talk about the ordinances of the church. What are the ordinances prescribed in the Word of God? And, and what do we believe about those things? So encourage you to be here Wednesday at 6 if you can. Then, as well, we have our Fall Festival coming up. That will be uh, Saturday, October 21st. And so... Uh, that's from 5 to 7. If you haven't signed up to volunteer to help, but are saying, you know what, I would love to still help, you can sign up. The sheet is still out there. Feel free to uh, sign up for that. We will still, uh, I think we are still collecting candy. We've had quite a bit turned in, but I don't think we're going to say no to more, so feel free uh, to bring more candy. We're looking forward to uh, a big day of reaching out to our community and uh, getting some things done there. So make sure you are inviting folks and um, as well as uh, sharing the event on Facebook. I know it goes a long way. A couple other things that I need to mention very quickly. Um, our outreach committee, we are uh, hoping to have a meeting tomorrow at 6 p.m. So I want to encourage you all for that. I have a couple of things uh, that I want to discuss in, in that tomorrow night uh, as well. And then a few other things that you see in your uh, bulletin there. Men, I want to make you aware. I know we've been advertising our church calendar um, that's been out there. If you haven't grabbed one or looked at it, we have a men's ministry event coming up on November 4th. We are going to get together. We're going to eat some barbecue, okay? Listen, you know me. I'm a barbecue guy, so we're going to have barbecue. And I want to encourage our men to come out and be a part of that. That's going to be uh, Saturday the 4th at 5 o'clock. I put a sign-up sheet out there. Uh, if you would sign up and let me know you're going to be there just so I can make sure I have enough food for everybody, that would be wonderful. We're going to have a great time of fellowship and uh, a time in the Word of God as well. And so I just want to encourage you uh, to come and be with us for that. And that is all I have today. We can hurry up and skip past that next picture. All right, let's all stand. We do appreciate our pastor. Do you know what? We appreciate his family as well. Karen and Camille and Tatum, we love them all. All right, let's sing O Mighty Cross.
is going to sing a special for us today. You sure you want to stay up here? <laughs> I can make faces behind you back here. That's okay. They make enough of them out there. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be on this side of heaven. Uh, but we all know that one day uh, we're going to go, we're going to pass away. And as a 60-year-old, I know I'm a pup to some of you, but those aches and pains and things I did when I was much younger are getting harder and harder to do. Uh, especially when we build our house, there's 19 stairs to get to the bedroom. I'm thinking about another option uh, as I do get, I, I've been serious, I'm getting older. But you know what, whatever ails us, when we close our eyes in death, we're going to wake up dancing. All right? Sadness in his grandson's eyes. He said, I gotta be prepared. Cause I'm going home tonight. I'm gonna waltz across the heavens while a band of angels play. We're gonna two step on some stardust a million miles away. We'll never have a new beginning until you reach the end. But these old legs are going to come to life again. We're going to wake up dancing. Well, if it's not too much trouble, there is just one thing left to do since i'm gonna see you grandma would you get her favorite shoes the ones with those ribbons they're red and trimmed in white the last time she had them on i believe we danced all night and why she left them here Plain to see Your grandma never danced with anyone but me And we're gonna waltz across the heavens While a band of angels play and we're gonna two-step on some stardust A million miles away You'll never have a new until you reach the end But these old legs are going to come to life again and We're going to waltz across the heavens While a band of angels play We're going to two-step on and so start us A million miles away You'll never have a new beginning until you reach the end But these old legs are gonna come to life again We're gonna wake up dancing I'm gonna wake up dancing 
Thank you, brother, for that song. I tell you, I am looking forward to the day when I get to be in the presence of Jesus and bow down at his feet and dance like I've never danced before. Absolutely. If you got your Bible, we'll be in Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Feel free to turn there if you need a Bible. There are some there in the seats. Of- Over the past two weeks, we have been looking at Jesus' message from Matthew 23 about the Pharisees and the scribes. And in that, we have been focused on learning from what Jesus said about the Pharisees and then what he said to the Pharisees. And uh, we have been trying to look at that to help us see what characteristics might identify people as a modern-day Pharisee. If we're being honest with ourselves, uh, as we've looked at the last two weeks, I would imagine that most of us have probably had one or two of these characteristics that at some point we have struggled with. I'm not saying we struggle with it all the time, but at some point we have all fallen into the trap of having some of these characteristics in our lives. Because these are all things that we must be on guard about. And so far in our our series, what we've seen is we've seen that modern day Pharisees assume authority that is not theirs. That they assume an authority and take on a role that God has not given them and they speak in ways for God that God did not say. Modern day Pharisees expect more from others than themselves. They hold other people to a higher standard then they're willing to hold themselves. We saw that modern-day Pharisees uh, make following Jesus feel like a burden. And listen, following Jesus should never feel like a burden. Uh, Some people uh, make modern-day Pharisees uh, desire attention. We saw last week, not only do they desire attention and they have to be that center of attention, but they desire recognition and honor. And this week, we're going to see three more characteristics from our passage. And as we look at it today, we're going to see that the Pharisees were a group of people who were very set in their ways. But more than that, they expected everyone else to to look, to live, to act just like they did. And the same thing happens in our churches today. Maybe you've known a Christian. Maybe you've known a pastor who in their desire to help people actually are quite rigid in their help. Listen, we've all known people that their way is the only way to do something. If they're going to help you, you need to do things exactly as they say to do it. And what happens is, instead of making disciples of Jesus, they end up making disciples of themselves. The question for us this morning is, who do we want people to be? Do we want them to be like Jesus? Or do we want them to be like me or like you? Who do we want people to be? And that's what the Pharisees did. They looked at it and they were making people to be like them. Now, This morning we'll see three more characteristics of a Pharisee and we'll look at the remedy to those three three characteristics in, in, in our message this morning. But before we read our passage, let me begin by pointing something out to you that you may notice as we read. I don't know what translation of the scripture you may have this morning. As most of you know, I read out of the New King James when I am preaching and we're going to be looking at verses 13, 14, and 15. Some of you, depending on your translation, you may find verse 14 not listed in your scripture. There may be a footnote with the, list, with the, the phrasing of what the verse says, uh, but it, it, uh, for some versions and translations, the verse is omitted with a footnote stating what verse 14 says. That is what we call a textual variant. In other words, the verse is found in some manuscripts, and not found in others. And for the sake of time, uh, I'm not going to get into all the details on textual variants. However, what I can tell you is that what we find in verse 14 
we find almost the exact same wording in two other places in Scripture. We find it in Mark Mark chapter 12 and Luke chapter 20. So as we read verse 14, whether your translation includes it or not, I want you to understand that we can be confident that Jesus did, in fact, say these words that we find in Matthew 23, 14. We can feel confident that as we read all three verses that Jesus did speak these words as they are found elsewhere in the scriptures as well. So with that said, let's go ahead and let's read Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 13. It says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again so much for your word. God, I thank you for the wisdom and the words contained within. God, I thank you that you have not left us all on our own. But God, you have revealed to us through the scriptures exactly what you would have us to know. And and God, I just thank you for that. I pray that as we look at these scriptures today, God, would you help us to have understanding? Would you help us to see these characteristics of of a Pharisee and a modern-day Pharisee today to to help us to be able to look for these traits in our lives and in our churches so that we can be on guard to be sure that we do not have these things and that we stay away from these things. God, I pray that you will bless your word. Help me as I speak. I pray that you will fill me with the Spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, if you remember, Jesus was speaking to a large crowd. And not only is he speaking to the crowd, he's speaking to his apostles. Mixed in to this crowd are a bunch of Pharisees and scribes. They're interspersed through the crowd. And these Pharisees and scribes, Jesus had just spent hours in debate with. And now he is out in verse 12, and and he is speaking to the crowd But then, in verse 13, his attention shifts from speaking to the crowd to now speaking directly to the Pharisees and the scribes. You can almost picture him as he's been uh, spending these first 12 verses talking to the crowd and telling them all about uh, what's been going on with these Pharisees and describing them. And you can just imagine the Pharisees in in the crowd kind of bristling every time he says something about them. And now he comes to verse 13, and you can almost picture him just now, instead of looking at the crowd, turning his gaze and beginning to look directly at each of these Pharisees and scribes who are in the crowd. No longer is he addressing everyone, he's addressing these people specifically. And as he speaks in verse 13, we see our next identifying characteristic of a modern-day Pharisee. Let me share you share with you this first one this morning. Modern-day Pharisees suppress the truth. Modern-day Pharisees suppress the truth. Notice verse 13 again. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Jesus issues this warning to the Pharisees that they are in grave danger of missing out on the kingdom of God themselves. But that's not the worst part of what they're doing. Not not only are they going to miss out on the kingdom, they are figuratively shutting the door to the kingdom for other people who want to go in. In other words, they are actually slamming the door shut, preventing other people from going in the kingdom. That's far worse than not going in yourself is when you decide you're going to cause other people to miss the kingdom as well. You see, understand something important here. The Pharisees believed and taught that the key to unlocking the door to the kingdom of heaven was obedience. 
they taught that it was obedience, not just obedience to the law, but that it was obedience to all of the other rules that they had added on top of the law. That Remember, we talked about they added over 600 law, man-made laws on top of what God had given them. And so the Pharisees, they demanded and said, listen, if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, if you're going to unlock that door, you need to have perfect obedience to the law. You need to have perfect obedience, not just to the law, but all of everything else that we've added. And so by demanding that kind of obedience, they were erecting a barrier that blocked the only true path to the kingdom of God, which was God's grace provided by faith through Jesus Christ. Now, because the scribes and Pharisees were considered to be experts in Scripture, they were convinced that their own understanding of the Scriptures was the only possible interpretation. As a result, they had missed out on the fact that those very same Scriptures they taught, those very Scriptures that they had studied, had all been pointing to Jesus as the Messiah all along. Jesus had warned them earlier in his ministry in John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. He said, you search the scriptures. Talking to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. You're looking for eternal life in the Scriptures, and it's the Scriptures that testify of me. They testify of Jesus Christ. But verse 40 says, But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. You see, the Scriptures pointed to Jesus, but the Pharisees refused to see it. And thus they kept teaching and teaching that it was the obedience to the law and they were pointing people away from Jesus. They were suppressing the truth of the Word of God. Now obviously, in our society today, we don't rely on on the uh, pastor. We don't rely on anyone else for access to the Scriptures. Um, Remember, in their society, they didn't have full access to it. And for us, though, we have it readily available. We have it in print. We have it on our phones. I've got it on my iPad. We have it everywhere. The Word of God is available to us. But that doesn't diminish the teaching of God's Word that takes place within the church. What's ironic is that many churches and many Christians, out of their desire to make sure they don't turn people away from Jesus, have done exactly what the Pharisees did. They've suppressed the truth of Scripture to make it seem more palatable and more acceptable to society. You see, it's interesting, as the Pharisees, remember, that these people in Jewish society, they did not have a copy of the Word of God. And so they relied on the Pharisees, they relied on the scribes to accurately relay what the Scripture said and taught. And even today, many people, we rely on those in authority to to help interpret Scripture. And unfortunately, so many religious institutions peddle the same false teachings as the Pharisees. They teach this idea that you must earn God's favor by following a strict set of rules. Now, Jesus might be mixed in there somewhere, but ultimately there are some religious institutions that teach that salvation is earned by a person's behavior. But then if we go to the other end of the spectrum, there are, again, so-called religious institutions, people, I would dare say they call themselves churches that teach that God is love, and that is true, God is love, but they go too far and they say he accepts everyone no matter how they come to him in other words they are fine with Jesus they just don't see Jesus as the only way to God listen to this uh, statement found on one church's website explaining what they believe this is a, a church out in Arizona here's what they said we are deeply rooted in the Christian faith I would doubt that, but that's what they said. We're deeply rooted in the Christian faith, but we appreciate the wisdom of other traditions. 
Too often, faith communities make exclusive claims on God and spiritual truth. At blank, at this church, we make no such claims. This is a church unwilling to even take a stand that Jesus is the only way to heaven. That He is the only source of salvation. Now, those are two extremes. There are some churches who find themselves right in the middle. Churches who believe that Jesus is the only way to God. But in order to make sure they don't offend anyone, and boy, do we live in a society that doesn't like to be offended. But in order to make sure they don't offend anyone, they fail to give a complete picture of who God really is. They fail to give a full picture of what is required for salvation. So in their pulpits and in their classrooms, you don't hear about things like sin and judgment and God's righteousness and His wrath and, God, and man's need for repentance. Those things are rarely addressed or brought up. Understand, listen, any religious system or any so-called Christian who fails to give the complete biblical picture of God and Jesus and fails to point people to Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, and fails to show that Jesus is the only way to God, that person is acting just like the Pharisees. They are slamming the door to the kingdom of God in people's faces. Listen, when we fail, or when we outright refuse to help people learn the truth that is found in God's word, when we have opportunity to do so, we are acting like a modern-day Pharisee. Let me ask you, are you suppressing the truth of the Word of God? You can suppress the truth in so many different ways. You can uh, not talk about the things that are found in the Word of God. I think for many of us, the way we suppress it, we just don't tell people about Jesus. We know the Word of God. We know Jesus is the only way, but we suppress it and we keep it to ourselves. Can I tell you, we're just in much danger of being a modern-day Pharisee when I fail to tell others the truth found in God's Word. Modern-day Pharisees, they suppress the truth. Secondly, I want to show you this. They use religion for selfish gains. They use religion for selfish gains. Notice again verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers... Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Notice it says the scribes and Pharisees devour widows' houses. That's an odd statement, isn't it? We look at that and we're like, what, are they eating somebody's house? What, what is it talking about? Listen, there are several possibilities of what is meant by this, but the most common view, and this view is kind of based on the Pharisees and scribes' own records, is this is that when a, woman, uh, when, a, when a woman became a widow and she wanted to make sure her estate was secure, she would bring in a scribe to take all of the legal work that was needed to protect her estate. Remember, most of them did not know how to read or write, so they would bring in these scribes to help with doing all of the documentation to protect their estate. But while pretending to protect the estate, the scribes, would actually mismanage the property for their own personal benefit. Sometimes they would actually even live in these houses and leech off of the widows, occupying their space, eating their food. In fact, they often took the house as collateral for the money that they would lend to the widow to pay their legal expenses. And so when the widow finally died, there was nothing left for her children or anyone else. It all belonged to the scribes. The overall idea of this phrase is they took advantage of the widows. In their time of need, they took advantage for their own personal selfish gains. Sometimes for the gains of the temple, but ultimately it was for their own personal advantage. Then to make matters worse, they cover up their acts. And they would cover it up by praying long prayers 
that were intended to show just how righteous they were. It's no wonder Jesus called them hypocrites. What's interesting is that in both the Mark and Luke accounts, when we read this verse, this verse is followed immediately by the story of the widow who gave her last two coins in the offering box. You remember that story? We often use that story as talking about the, you know, uh, the principle of giving of what we have and, and that even our two cents isn't, you know, it, it, when we give of what we've got and we give sacrificially, then God will use that. And, and that's all perfectly valid. But perhaps he's showing us something else here as well. Perhaps she, he's showing us that this widow has been so cheated to such a point that all she now has left because of these scribes and Pharisees is two little coins. That's one of the things we see. That, that story follows right after the, this account of the widows being cheated by the scribes. So what does all of this have to do with us today? How do we see this play out in our modern day? Listen, there are some people, whether they are preachers, whether they are religious leaders, Listen, it doesn't matter who they are. They court the attention and favor of vulnerable people for their own selfish gains. Maybe they're respected religious individuals who seek out large donations or endowments. Maybe they seek out gifts to promote themselves or to promote their institution or their organization. Listen, I think I've told you all about this before. Uh, There was one pastor who one time... Uh, his whole purpose was to make sure that he ingratiated himself with the widows so that to the point that, that he would try to get them to put him in their wills. Listen. The great tragedy is that these hypocritical individuals use the guise of religion to promote themselves to promote their false ideas, to advance their own self-interest. And notice what Christ said about these individuals who do this, who take advantage of the weak for their own personal gain. He says their condemnation will be greater. Listen, I know we like, and we do say, listen, all sin is sin in God's sight. But we can't discount verses like this where God makes it pretty clear. There are some sins that are going to cause some greater condemnation, and this is one of them. There are some sins that are more serious, and using religion for selfish ends is absolutely one of them. But how does that apply to us? I hope, and I'm going to hope and assume, and I believe that no one in here this morning is trying to cheat Um, is trying to cheat some widows out of some money for their own personal gain. I'm very hopeful and prayerful that's not taking place in our church today. But let me ask a question. Can the godly concern for the lost and starving masses, think about it, can a godly concern for those who are lost and starving of God, can that be from the same God that causes us to focus on huge, ornate buildings. To focus on our homes and our bank accounts. Can all of that be from the same God? What is God focused on? Is God more worried about how grandiose our building is? Or is He more concerned about lost souls? See, that's the point. A lot of churches, we've come to the place where we're more concerned about how everything appears. Do I, is my bank account big enough? Is my house uh, big enough? Is my house this? Is our church building like this? Listen, I, I look at some of the church buildings that they build, and I can't help but think, is that, is that really what we need to focus on and where we need to put our time and attention? Is that where we need to put all of our resources to, where we just say, everybody give, 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 so we can have the nicest building in town? Or are we giving for the lost? Are we giving to reach people for Jesus Christ? Listen, that's the point. We take advantage of people. Ultimately, what are we building? 
Are we building our church? Are we building our life? Or are we building God's kingdom? God doesn't need a, a and listen, I love our building. We have a nice building. But God doesn't need us to have a building coated with gold, does he? Who or what are we trying to benefit and honor? Are we trying to, to honor God and seeking to see lost people saved? Or are we only trying to benefit ourselves, even to the point that we'll use our religion to do so? Let me show you a third thing. Modern day Pharisees expand their influence. By the way, just one quick thing as I was thinking about this using religion for selfish gains, be careful of politicians. I mean, how many politicians put down, they've got to make sure they put down what church they go to just so they can look religious to get your vote. Listen, everybody does it. A lot of people do it. A lot of so-called Christians use religion for their selfish gains. All right. Number three, they expand their influence. Verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Listen, while we've said a lot of negative things about the Pharisees, we have to give them credit for one thing. They were zealous about winning people, winning new converts to their religion. They were willing to go to any lengths necessary to win just one person. It didn't matter if they had to go over land or sea. They would seek that person out if they could win them to what they were teaching. They would go to any length necessary to make proselytes. Proselytes were Gentiles who were converted to Judaism. And in the culture of their time, there were two kinds of proselytes. There were proselytes of the gate. And these proselytes were people that got their name because they just barely got in the gate. They attended the synagogue. They stopped worshiping their false gods. But they never fully committed to following Jewish law. Then there was another group of proselytes, and these were the proselytes of righteousness. These are the ones that fully bought into being a Jew. They had themselves circumcised to follow the law. They usually became just like the Pharisees who had won them. They became self-righteous, legalistic, tradition-keeping individuals. Now, understand, there weren't as many of these kinds of proselytes as the ones at the gate. But this is exactly who the Pharisees were after. The Pharisees wanted people who they could get that would come and follow them. The problem wasn't the fact that the Pharisees were so zealous about getting new converts. The problem is, again, why they were doing it. The, see, because the more people they converted, the more people they brought under their teaching, the more power and influence they could wield. That's what their followers were for them. The more people who follow my teachings, the more powerful I will be and, and the greater influence I will have. They wanted to add to their numbers, not because it meant more people submitting to God, but because it would benefit them personally. So they tried to develop these new converts to look like them, to act like them, instead of trying to get them to please God. And Jesus, he saved his harshest condemnation for this act. He said they were making their converts twice as much a son of hell as they were. They were doubling the condemnation of these converts. The primary people that, that, that they were going after were the God-fearing and devout people already interested in Judaism. These were people already interested in following the God of Israel. But more than becoming converts, they became extremely zealous of what these Pharisees taught. These converts became so indoctrinated that they were made into fanatics who were more devoted than many actual Jews. Now from the outside, we can see this same thing happening in many cults. 
Think about a lot of cults. They focus on an outward conformity instead of an inward devotion to God. But we see it in our churches too. Have you ever run into someone who keeps score? What I mean by that is they keep score and they can, they can tell you exactly how many people they have won to the Lord. I've seen some Christians treat reaching souls as a competition. Let's see who can win the most souls. But that type of attitude, it takes the focus off God and it puts it on ourselves. Another way we do it, we do this by trying to convert people to a denomination or to a system of theology. Listen, when we are more focused on our denomination than on Jesus, we are doing just like the Pharisees. We're telling people they need to follow our set of man-made rules instead of following God and His Word. So what do we do? If we find ourselves in this situation of sometimes suppressing the truth, or maybe we use religion for our own selfish gains, or maybe we try to expand our own influence more than God's, and we try to get people to follow and do exactly like we do, what can we do to remedy the situation? Let me give you a few quick thoughts. Remedy number one is study the Bible. Study the Bible. Listen, every follower of Jesus is called not just to be a student of the Word, but to be a dispenser of the truth found in it. It is not the responsibility of just the pastor to tell people the truths found in the Word of God. Everyone here this morning, I don't care who you are, everyone here will have opportunities to share biblical truth with people that I will never meet. You come across people that I don't encounter, and you are the one with the opportunity to share biblical truth. And when we have those opportunities, we're either going to share the truth or we're going to suppress it. Well, why would we suppress it? Why would we not share the truth that we claim to love in our hearts? It's either because we don't know the truth or because we haven't taken the time to study it for ourselves. Listen, we, 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 we don't know the truth, we haven't studied it, we don't know it, and because of that, and then others of us, we, don't, we suppress the truth because we have an inaccurate view of Scriptures. Maybe we just don't know it, or maybe we have the wrong view of it, but we have a way that we suppress the truth. Listen, no matter which reason it is, there is only one remedy. If you're going to share God's truth, if you're going to do it correctly, if you suppress the truth because you don't know it, then study the Word of God to learn it. If you suppress the truth because your view of Scripture is mistaken, the only remedy is to study it and discover what the Word of God really says. Listen, to study the Word means to read it on our own, not just when we come on Sunday morning. Read it on our own, in our own personal time of devotion. It also means to sit under solid Bible teaching and preaching like we do every Sunday morning and Wednesday night here. It means studying the Bible with others in a setting that allows us to learn from them and to contribute to their learning as well, like we do every week in Sunday school and our women's and men's Bible studies. Listen. Take advantage of the opportunities given to you to study the Word, both in your own personal time and the opportunities given by the church. Listen, Sunday school is there to help us learn and grow. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 says this, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So many of us, we're afraid to talk to people about Jesus because we don't know the Word of God like we should. Listen, there is a solution. Get in the Word of God and study it. 
You don't have to stay ignorant of the Scriptures. You can know what the Bible teaches to the point that you can share it with others. That's what Proverbs teaches. Listen, we ought to love the Word of God so much that we seek it out. We want to know what it says. And God says if we will do that, if we'll seek it as silver and search for it as a hidden treasure, then we will find the knowledge of God. Remedy number one, study the Bible. Remedy number two, don't study with preconceptions. Listen, this is an easy trap for us to fall into. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you find out that each of us, we develop our own ideas about certain things in the Bible based on what we've been taught and what we've learned over the years. And yes, there are some things in the Bible that are absolutely black and white. And if it's spelled out in black and white, we should not falter. We should not uh, give in on those. We hold to those things firmly. But there are some areas where we need to be careful that we don't take our preconceived ideas and insert them into the Scriptures. And unfortunately, too many Christians do that. We take our ideas and we push them into the Scripture. Number three, don't insist on your own way. Don't insist on your own way. Not everything has to be done the way you do it. For instance, the Bible encourages us to use all types of music in our worship. But it doesn't specify which songs we're supposed to sing. It doesn't specify what instruments we're supposed to be using. The Bible teaches us that we're to give back unto God as He has given unto us. But the Bible doesn't specify and say whether that has to be done by passing an offering plate or putting a box in the back. It doesn't specify those things. The Bible tells us that we're to observe the Lord's Supper, but it doesn't specify how often we're to do it. And it doesn't even specify the exact format that we're supposed to do it. It just tells us to observe it. Listen, when it comes to things that are specifically outlined in the Bible, we all have our, our preferences, and that's fine. But we need to make sure that we aren't trying to force our own personal preferences on others. And we need to make sure that we aren't insisting that our way is the only right way. Essentially, it all comes down to this single thought. And I said it earlier, I can either build my kingdom or I can build God's kingdom. I can either try to develop people who look like me or people who look like Jesus. Listen, the only one that has any lasting value is building God's kingdom by helping people to look like Jesus. Whose kingdom are you building today? Who are you trying to get others to look like? Are you trying to get other people to look like you? Or do you want them to look like Jesus? That's the question. Modern day Pharisees, it's all about me. Everybody needs to look like me, act like me. It's all about benefiting me. Who are you really more concerned about? You or getting people to be like Jesus? I'm going to ask our instrumentalists to come. As they come forward, if God is speaking to your heart, we're going to have a moment of response where if God is speaking, you can feel free to come to the front. The altars will be open. You're welcome to come and to pray. If you need someone to pray with you, I'd be happy to do that as well. I'll be right down front in the center. Maybe you need to come and pray about something that had absolutely nothing to do with the message. Maybe God's been speaking to you about something else. Listen, if God is speaking to you, whether it's this message or something else, don't, don't ignore him. Don't ignore what he's saying. Don't ignore how he's prodding you. Respond to him today. Listen, maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You've never trusted him. Listen, the only way into the kingdom of heaven is through Jesus Christ. He is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Listen, are you trusting him today? As you stand, the heads bowed and eyes closed. As they play, would you respond?
us today, and I pray that you've been blessed. Listen, uh, don't forget, uh, outreach committee meeting, for those of you that are on that, tomorrow at 6, and then um, Wednesday night, our We Believe series, and men, don't forget to sign up for our men's barbecue. Uh, listen, looking forward to that, all right? So make sure you do those things, and uh, looking forward to that. We're gonna, I'm going to close, I'm going to do this just a little bit differently. I'm going to ask uh, Brother John, would you close us in prayer? And after he finishes his prayer, we're going to sing our song to, to close us out. So I'm going to ask Mr. Brother John to pray for us and dismiss us, and then we'll sing our song. Family of God. Yeah.